We are opening Living Machines with a presentation by uh, Ricard Soler. Ricard is an ICREA research professor in, uh, in Barcelona at the University of Pompeo Fabra, um, trained both in biology and physics. And what Ricard has been, has been doing very successfully is to actually bring those domains together, to on the one hand bring the, the quantitative methods of physics together with the complexity of biology. And of course, you, you might see that there's a huge domain of what people might call artificial life and synthetic biology and so on. But I think Ricard actually plays a very special role in that whole domain because he is really very successful in so sort of having an impact not only in the analysis of complex biological systems, but also translating that into an empirical observable approach towards understanding of life and in that sense, the living machines that we know in nature. So Ricard also in that approach, I think is opening new doors and new windows on understanding of evolution and life. And I'm looking forward to your talk, Ricard. And it's great to have you here. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot for the organizers um, for inviting me here, especially being here in this very, very special place. Um, my talk intends to present some of the, of the views that have been you know, building up in my lab over the last uh, 20 years of researching complex systems. And as you will see, it connects uh, with uh, the, the major topics of the conference uh, in, a, in a special way. And especially, uh, it connects with some, something that is, is very important, which is essentially the, the origin of innovations in biology. Um, we perceive the, the change of uh, complexity in biology over, over time in the biosphere as a process of change where the dominant view has been the, the Darwinian paradigm, so uh, selection uh, operating on very long time scales. And I think that too often is presented uh, the Darwinian view of the world, which is a spectacular one, of course, um, as kind of the, the final thing. And uh, people like uh, Richard Dawkins, who, who I admire uh, a lot, uh, tends, to, for example, to say that, you know, uh, natural selection already explains everything. Um, but in reality, we need still to understand a lot of things. Uh, in particular, we need to understand how the big things started to happen. So how did life originate? How uh, complex cells uh, came out? How multicellularity emerged? Uh, and you can make a list of things here. Um, and that list, which will include at the end um, the origin of consciousness as a kind of a, a repertoire of possibilities um, has to be seen uh, under different perspectives. One thing I want to mention, because it's, it's important for the discussion we'll need to make, concerns about the mechanisms. And most of you have a, a training in, in engineering and a, a good knowledge of evolution. What's the difference between one, one and, and the other? And I think that Francois Jacob pointed that uh, years ago in, this, in, in his famous paper in, in science that a major difference, which is very important, is the tinkering. So the, the engineer in principle can do whatever he wants. He can actually ignore the whole previous technology. You know it's not exactly like that, but in principle it could. And whereas evolution cannot. Evolution cannot foresee the future. It has no plans of anything. And has to reuse. Reuse is fundamental. And uh, so bricolage, uh, tinkering, uh, is the strategy that is taken. It, it, it might seem that it's not a good thing for engineering, but it's, it's been spect spectacularly successful for evolution. I put the embryo here because it's, it's an illustration of the well-known well uh, observation that genes that are used in development, in building a living thing, uh, are used in, in, in the nervous system, in constructing the gut, and in many different places. The same genes are reused for many different things. That's, that's one of the reasons why, in particular, it's so difficult to tackle with complex diseases, because there's a lot of entanglement 
in terms of the genetic network that is uh, behind. Another thing that is very important, and it's, it's really important for this presentation, is predictability. So you, you might think in evolution as something that is a strongly historical process. So being historical means that it's, it's path dependent. And you might probably have heard about uh, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, one of the, the great evolutionary biologists of the 10th century. He defended the idea that because evolution is strongly historical, you were able to go back in time before the Cambrian explosion and, and look back, look, look forward what will be the unfolding of evolution, we will observe a completely different biosphere. Well, is that so? Or there are, there are constraints that actually make the possible much less um, diverse. This is a very good book, which actually presents kind of the, the, the counterbalance to, to Gould's idea. Um, Simon Conway Morris is a very well-known paleobiologist, and he wrote this book, Life Solution. It's not a self-help book. It sounds like that, but it's not. Uh, it involves uh, an in-depth dis uh, discussion about convergence. You know, in biology, repeatedly evolution has reinvented the same things again and again uh, in completely independent paths. The eye, multicellularity, there's a lot of examples of that. And interestingly, very often the solution is the same, essentially the same. So as if a, an engineer had decided that this is what I want. What actually what happens is that not everything is possible and the optimal or suboptimal but likely solutions of uh, a given problem are essentially the same. So in that respect, um, and, I, and I put myself in that, in that uh, set, people working in complex systems, we do think that probably we were able to that, do that experiment, go back in time and make the tape go forward. We will see a different biosphere, but clearly familiar one. And that's an important thing. I put the example of the Renz rule. It's something that is it's well known in, in large scale uh, circuit design. And there's a number of scaling laws that you find in, in, in large scale circuits that seem to reappear in, in brain structures at a small scale as if the way we can pack things in an optimal way, it's the same, no matter you are an engineer or you are the outcome of evolution. Well, it's been a number of uh, strong efforts in, in making a list of the major transitions. What are the major transitions of evolution? What are the really big innovations? Uh, these two guys here, Eros Chasmari uh, and uh, John Minor Smith, they, they tried to do that years ago. And in 1995, they published uh, a book that you might have seen, and this paper in Nature, which is essentially a, a reduced version, where they try to put together uh, a, number, a list of major innovations. Right? Most of the, of the elements of the list have to do with replication. So how, how do you achieve a, a higher level of complexity that leads to a structure that is able to self-replicate? Because replication is very, very important in biology. And it makes a difference with standard technology. So they made a, an interesting list. Uh, not everything is there, uh, but the, the book had a huge impact, which keeps growing in time and has spread uh, over all disciplines. Um, some people have made different lists. For example, this book, Life Ascending, which is, I think, quite interesting, quite recommendable. Uh, you see Origin of Life, DNA, uh, or multicellularity, the complex cell as, as major transitions, but also movement, uh, sight, uh, hot blood, consciousness, or death. Death sounds strange, but without death, we will not be here, meaning programmed cell death. You have to have death to have complexity. There's no escape from that. And other people make other lists, right? Um, language, of course, is, is a major thing. Uh, the superorganism, potential for having a cooperative society of things where individuals are not very com complicated in a cognitive way, but the collective can, can be. Um, this is the list I put to my students. We have this, this four-year bioengineering degree in Barcelona, which I think is cool because it's standard engineering plus evolutionary biology, um, complexity theory, uh, evolutionary algorithms, all sorts of things. And this is my list that I put to them to see what are the these potential main in innovations and how they relate with ongoing engineering, right? Um, the list should include sex, but engineering sex is, I, I found that more difficult to explain. So that's, that's fine, that's a good list. 
and let's go step by step. Um, one of the um, one of the things that came out from thinking about that is is a is a position paper that we are we just uh, finishing with Eorsias Mari, trying to actually make a list of the following thing. So we are in the position today of actually looking at the, the major transitions from our perspective as engineers, synthetic biologists, or even theoreticians. So actually, we are in the position of trying to reproduce some of the transitions or maybe find out alternatives. So the question that, that we, we put in this paper is um, whether or not we can actually reproduce the transitions and whether or not maybe be different things that we have been ignoring. And I want to, to address that at some point. Well. I guess that for this audience, everyone is, is fan of uh, automata. Um, I like to put the example of the, the automata because in a way, historically, has been mentioned before, uh, that's one of the main threats that in a way uh, produced a lot, of that, a lot of philosophical thinking about uh, what is life and what, is, what makes life special and whether or not life has to do with machines. Uh, this is uh, Jacques Dror's automaton. The one, the original one, right? It still is, is in France, and as you can see, still working. So it's not it's not like your iPad that is going to be obsolete in a couple of years. So it's still working. Yeah, it was a spectacular machine. It can be uh, programmed, right? So you can actually make the automaton write different things. In particular, the famous um, saying by Descartes, you know, I I, I think so I am exist. Um, a funny story about that that they always tell, because many people doesn't know, is that at the time these automata were built, they were the marvels of engineering of the, of the 18th, 19th century. And there were, there were no rock bands, but who, who went on tour if there were no rock bands? The, the automata uh, creators. So Jacques Dros was on tour in Europe. He made the mistake to go to Spain. And um, it was a mistake because it was, it was a time where someone who built a machine that pretend to be a living thing, a human thing, was seen as a, as a heretic thing. So the funny part of the story, it's not, not for Jacket Rhodes, of course, but the funny part of the story is that they put in jail the creator of the automaton and the automaton. So they put all together in a, in a cell for a couple of days, both of them. So they gave the automaton the, the credibility that they were trying to, to, to take. Um, in my lab, we work uh, on synthetic biology. It's part of our, our research. Uh, so we have a lab to build um, living things that do not exist. And every time a journalist comes to our office to ask about something, Frankenstein comes out. It's inevitable. So I, I put Frankenstein also. Um, but I put also this reconstruction of one of the Da Vinci automata, uh, which is one of these, those spectacular things. And uh, I just wanted to mention that one of the interesting things that is going on now is that we see many different disciplines coming together, uh, including mathematics, uh, statistical physics, but molecular biology, coming together to build new things. And it's interesting that in Frankenstein, um, Victor Frankenstein, the, the, the main character, at some point it says, he says that if you want to be a man of science, you have to actually do that, you know, to know about very different disciplines, including mathematics. There are some dots there that are, are very insulting comments uh, about experimental people, so I, I, I tend to remove that from the presentation. The thing is that synthetic biology, what is it? And what, what, is, what pretends to do? Well, synthetic biology is kind of the the granddaughter of genetic engineering, uh, except that the idea is not just to, to change a gene or put a gene inside the cell. The idea is to rewire things and put new circuits within cells and change the logic. I wanted to make a mention, a special mention, since I mentioned mathematics, about why this is important in the context of looking at the evolution of things. One of, the, one of the things that we have been pursuing over the years is the, is the following question. Um, is what we see in evolution the only possibility, as I mentioned before, uh, or is one possibility between, among many? So, so what can you say from the scientific point of view, not just a, an opinion? I think that, that for Neumann's uh, contribution to that is really interesting. Uh, for a main reason. For those of you who don't know, von Neumann at the end of his life 
was thinking about a lot of things related to machines and biology. And one of the things I was exploring is the idea of what do you need for a machine to be able to self-replicate, right? Have in mind that self-replication is one of the, the core things of biological systems. So that was years ahead of molecular biology. No idea about DNA replication. No idea about what was the logic of cells, the real cells. So it's interesting that von Neumann ended up with the idea that what you need in a machine to self-replicate is a system that contains a set of instructions that in a way drive the construction of the machine. But when the machine replicates, it has to replicate the instructions altogether. And the way it has to be done has to involve a duplicator, something that involves the replication of the information, a controller, a constructor. If you ask a molecular biologist or cell biologist, what, what does that suggest to, to him or to her? He would immediately say, well, this is a cell. That's what, how a cell works. And it's interesting because then everything was confirmed in a way. But it suggests something really, really thrilling, which is the possibility that maybe the logic of self-replication is completely unique. It doesn't matter what you look at. It requires all these elements, and probably only in this way is constructed. Just to mention very briefly that if you look for metaphors of molecular machines, uh, of course, Turing has come a number of times. I show to my students also this video of a Lego Turing machine. So it kind of you know, seems simple, but try to build it. And it is interesting that uh, Turing work, of course, was also years ahead of molecular biology. It is not trivial, I think, the fact that part of the computations that are done within cells involve a macromolecular device that reads tapes, right? That reads strings of letters from a different alphabet than 0 and 1, the four-letter alphabet. And not all the computations are like that at all. But it's part of the story. It's interesting to, to realize that. So can we engineer cells and tissues? How far can we go with that? And what insight is this giving us about how computations are done within cells and how does that evolve over time? Synthetic biology has been, uh, it's a young science. It's, it's it's in the adolescence, right? Uh, and is now entering into the exponential phase. So now it's a lot of things are going on. It's been a lot of hype also. But in, nevertheless, um, many things have happened. Uh, at the beginning, people just started to make small circuits that involve switches, which is very important to create memory things in, in cells, uh, clocks. Um, some successes have been done. So you have now uh, cells where a whole engineering has been done so that, for example, they give drugs against malaria, so making the cost much cheaper and making things much easier for the people who require that. Um, one thing that was done, and I wanted to mention that, it made a lot of noise at the point, but I think it, it contains an interesting ingredient. Uh, some years ago, you probably heard that uh, Craig Venter, this, this guy who is kind of a polemic person, um, claimed that in his lab, uh, the first artificial cell has, has been created, right? This is not true, really. What they did is, is take the genome, genome of a cell, a known cell, uh, mycoplasma. So they take the genome, they reconstruct the whole genome in, inside a, a machine, so from using computer and chemical techniques. So you re, rebuild the sequence, which doesn't mean that you understand what the sequence does, which is very different from an, an engineering perspective. You remove things that you don't want, which is good, because may maybe there's toxins or things that you don't want there. They put their names and other crap like that. And then they re-implant that inside another cell where DNA has been previously removed. So you switch, uh, you switch on the computer, and their cell starts to replicate again. There's one interesting thing on that, I think, that about the logic of evolution, uh, which I think is, is interesting to point out. It is true, one thing, that until that moment, every cell in Earth came from another cell. So that's a continuum that connects us with the, with the past. That's not true anymore. So there's this this something that in the logic of life that has been broken. Um, personally, I, I, I like a, a particular thing that Benter, Benter is, really, is really a character. But one thing that he said, I, I found it interesting. In an interview, he was asked by the journalist something like, people said that you guys are are, are playing God. And Benter said, who said we are playing? 
So the potential for that, and I want to mention that because I think it's one of the interesting uh, things beyond our understanding of nature, is that complex diseases, which is a, a huge variety of things, the majority of, of diseases, has to do not with uh, the failure of a single unit of our organism, but instead of a, of a logic circuitry, feedbacks or other regulatory things that have failed and have to be repaired, okay? I'll give you some example on that. So the potential for engineering that are great because we can actually break some rules that have been established by evolution and, and rewire things in completely different ways. I'll give you some example of that, but that's, that's something that is really promising, and if it works, it's going to change uh, our view of the bi biomedical research. And one of the major th where places where there's a lot of potential for really changing things is the mic microbiome. Uh, we know now that we cannot see ourselves as a, as a single organism, really. Uh, you know now our genome is composed about 25,000 25, genes, but we host a whole biosphere inside us, lots of species of microbes, which amount about 3 million genes in total. And we know, and we know more and more, that this has been the result of a coevolutionary process. It's not like we just host them. We have been coevolving with them. And it seems that evidence is mounting that uh, diseases and um, failures of our, of our organism have to do with failures and, and miswork of the, of the microbiome. And there's a lot of possibilities of intervening on that, of engineering that. Oops. So what can be done? What are the limits? Um, one of the metaphors that is usually used, and I want to, to go for that, is the idea that these cellular circuits within cells are kind of a circuits, circuits like in standard engineering. So the thing, the, the idea that many people has been using, uh, I think that sometimes in a quite misleading way, is this view that cells can be seen really as electronic circuits. So you can think in that and engineer, engineer uh, circuits in that way. And I'll show you why we think is, this is not the way of doing it. So, a lot of things have been done. For example, you can build circuits inside cells. I'll, I'll show you some, uh, some small circuits, for example, that implement uh, memory devices. That actually has not been done, really. But in this paper, for example, which is interesting enough, uh, these people show that they could build a NOR gate, which, as you know, the NOR gate is the universal gate from which an electronic engineer could build anything, right? So they extrapolate that in a very funny way, and at some place they say that we built an OR gate, so in principle we could build any, any kind of complex device in a computer, right? They should, they should put in principle, right? Because in principle, as you know, very often means maybe it's impossible, okay? So uh, biology is different in a number of ways, and I'll show you why you have to rethink the way of doing engineering. Imagine you want to build a simple gate inside the cell, so you can build something that is not there, and you are going to do that using genes that might come from a virus, uh, pieces that come from mammalian cells or bacteria or wherever, right? You put them together because you can do it. And then, for example, you have two inputs and one output. We used to, in the experimental part, in the initial part of this, the, the studies, we used to use fluorescent proteins as the output signal. So it's one, if it's fluorescent, zero is not. So for example, I can build a simple circuit, two genes that receive signals, they create a, a dimer, and if the dimer is created, you stimulate the gene that gives you the, the, the reported signal. So this is a, a, an AND gate, fine. So why not to extrapolate that and do whatever? Well, look at that. Imagine you want to do something more complicated. You want to build inside your cell, for whatever reason, a multiplexer, right? So essentially you have three input signals. One of the signals acts as a channel, so you choose which one of the other signals comes, comes out, right? And this in principle is simple, can be implemented very easily, combinatorial logic. And I can draw, I can draw the equivalent inside the cell. How can, could I engineer things? So I just, for example, do this. This is a simple circuit, relatively simple, by drawing. But what's the problem with that? So how can, how can this be a problem? Well, there's a fundamental difference here. The cables inside an electronic circuit are exactly the same. They are all the same thing, 
right? But if I want to connect different genes inside the cell, the cables, which means signals that are carried by a molecule that float in the middle of the, of the cell, I have to find out another place to, to trigger a response, cannot be the same, right? I cannot use, use different cables. So I have to use different cables. That doesn't sound very impressive, but as soon as you go to the lab and you start to use more than one signal to connect things, you enter into the nightmare of what we call the crosstalk. Because it's very, very easy, since things are reused for many things, that your signal, that the molecule that you're using as a wire, connects to some, somewhere else and essentially fucks up everything. So how, what do you do? What's the alternative? Because people have been talking and talking for years of building more complex uh, circuits, but not doing that. So you go and try to get inspiration into something different, right? Being at the Santa Fe Institute for, for now many years, it's been interesting to, to be in the middle of uh, um, a group of people who is all the time trying to re rethink things in different ways. And it's good to look at computation in, in different perspectives. And for us, uh, for many years, we work also on, on modeling collective intelligence. Um, I mentioned the example, not because I'm going to use that exactly, although we'll go back to that in synthetic biology in connection to that, um, but because ants are, are a different metaphor. So the, the computation, which is a, a fundamental characteristic of living things, is placed and, um, and used in a different way. And nevertheless, I know no one is listening to me now, so um, I have to shift the video, please. Sorry. It, it's, it's there. It's in, it's in the internet. So what we try to do is do something different, right? If we cannot engineer within cells, single cells, complex things, let's try to do something totally different, right? So um, we had the opportunity in Barcelona to bring together two different groups. Downstairs is a, is a worldwide known uh, group of people doing uh, uh, signaling within cells in yeast. And we thought we could do something about that. And along with um, Javier Macia, who is the guy uh, at, the, at the right there, not the completely right, Years ago, we had uh, some ideas, some crazy ideas about non-standard computation. We never used them. But at the, at the point we get into trying to rethink uh, synthetic computations in cells, we found out that our picture could work. Uh, I have to say it's been a very interesting experience to be working with experimental people for both sides. At the beginning, every time we went with our drawings, um, Francesc Posas, the guy right there, in the middle was saying, no, no, this, do you think it's going to work? Whereas we were all the time impatient about the, the, the lab results. Why, why is this taking so long, you know? So after four years, it's like, it's like an, an old couple, you know, you adapt. And, and every time we went with a drawing to, to Francesc, he, he usually says, yeah, this is going to work. Whereas we understand now that things take a long time to, to get built. So. How you do that? How you do something different from standard electronics, which is the, is the, is the main way of uh, inspiring things? Well, imagine three, you, you do three things. The first, the, the circuit is going to be multicellular. You, you're going to do engineering cells, different types of engineering in different cells, right? That's, that's not new. That was already being, being done. Imagine that the circuit can be broken, broken in different pieces. means that you have the circuitry, you broke it, and it's not connected. You have separated things, right? This, this is not compatible with standard engineering. And imagine that the output, instead of having an input and somewhere you have the output located, the output can be everywhere, right? So the metaphor will be something like that. This will be a standard. We can do that. We can break into parts, right? The output can be in both sub-circuits. And maybe we break into three, and two of the cells, every circuit will be, every part will be a cell, right? Maybe one cell doesn't have an output, but it connects with something that does. So if you do that, which is a completely different way of, uh, of doing things, it doesn't happen in nature, so it's a different thing. It's possible to show, for example, the multiplexer that I just showed you. You can build the multiplexer in this way. You have two cells that have been engineered, engineered in different ways. One receives two inputs. The other receives two inputs. They are not connected. If one of the cells 
gives the signal, the, uh, the output is a one for the whole circuit. If none, is a zero. Okay? So that's essentially the, the logic of the thing. But using that, you can show very easily, and you can actually do that mathematically, that you have a library of engineered cells. You can build, for example, for yeast, you would build a multiplexer in this way. Two cells are connected, the other one is not connected. Um, and you can keep going, right? You can build a comparator, you can build, a, this is a for um, a parity circuit detector, which will be very complicated to build. If you want to build really piece by piece inside the cell. That is almost trivial with our method. So you can actually uh, use four cells. And one of the great things is that you can re reuse almost everything. So you don't have to do the, the whole engineering for every cell every time. Just to mention that actually if you analyze the logic, so what are the, the standard elements that are more likely to be used, is nor AND gate, nor gate. It's the, what we call the N implies. The main, the main gate that is used is also different from the standard electronics. And you can extrapolate that into space. We just completed a paper on that. You can use uh, a microfluidic system. So you put cells also segregated in space. And then you can show that you can reduce the, the wiring problem into almost nothing. You just need a, a, a single wiring molecule. And you can do extremely complex computations. So the main message of that is that maybe if we want to do new, uh, new engineering in, in, in biological systems, we need to avoid some of the standard metaphors, because you, you don't get too far with that, right? So beyond cells, the evolutionary question is, how did multicellular life emerge? And our engineering question is, can we redo that? Can we rebuild that somehow? So that's a picture I show to my students uh, of bioengineering every year, believing that they, they, they will know what is it. You know what is it? Which movie is that? Blade Runner, very well. You're, you're on the good track. Unfortunately, my students, to my surprise, don't know. So maybe one among the 40. So we force them actually to watch the movie because they can find out in the exam, and I'm serious, some question about that. So this is the guy in Blade Runner who builds the eyes. And when the, when the movie was out, what was that, 25 years ago, something like that, uh, that was kind of a funny thing, the, the eye engineering. It is not funny anymore, you will see in a moment. Um, and one of the things that is one of the challenges that we have is how far can we go in the lab using synthetic biology to push things that are unicellular into the multicellular world? So to what extent can we manipulate single cell organisms to behave like tissues, right? So in a way, we, we are not just looking at the history of life or making models. We can actually build that and see to what extent can we reproduce the same things, or maybe something completely different. One of the inspirations that we have, uh, that we are following in my lab, we have a wet lab now. We have been theoreticians for 25 years, but now, five years ago, we built our own wet lab, to the terror of everyone in the building, because, of course, theoreticians doing experiments, that's, that's going to be a mess. Now it's delivering. And one of the things that we wanted to do in, in, in the direction of multicellularity is whether or not we can build synthetic Turing structures. You know, Turing also at the end of his life was thinking about how, how, do you, how do you go into a single cell system into a whole organism made out of trillions of cells? How do you create the structure there, right, from the original information? And he ended up with this very famous model uh, where essentially he found out that if you couple, mathematically, if you couple uh, two molecules that react in space, you can show that for free, in a way, for self-organization, you get ordered structures. And he conjectured that, that that could be the origin of information that, you know, that unfolds through development, right? Um, I recently found out a website where you have all the scanned Turing uh, handwriting things. And if you go into the morphogenesis part, it's just amazing. The, the amount of things that he did, they were, ne were never published. So the Turing, the Turing idea, this idea that from a system that is almost homogeneous, from the fluctuations, the, the original chaos, you, you get this special order, and you get these this ordered structures, has been shown to, to happen in physics, in chemistry, and in biology, there's a lot of indirect evidence. Some, some paper is going to come out soon uh, in science, uh, about in a group of my, in my building, where actually I think that they show for the first time the direct evidence from the real biology. And our strategy in my lab is 
whether or not we can build that from scratch. So they can actually build tuning structures. We know exactly what, what is there and, and how can we tune. I can tell it works. So I hope we soon have a, a paper out there too. Another thing that's very important, it will connect with the, with the machines and the robots uh, when we, we, we get there, is the embodiment and the, and the simulation of systems. Um, another, another thread that we are following is to make uh, artificial life models of the emergence of multicellularity, which essentially are based on the idea that you have to have uh, your, your genes, you have to have evolution, you have to have the potential for cooperation, but you have also to have things that have to do with the physics. So cells have to be in a place in space. They have to be able to adhere to the substrate to connect physically with the others. That seems something not so important. But it, it turns out that when you put that into, into a model where you have the evolution, that plays a major role. And we have found out that actually some things that might have escaped to the evolutionary biologists about the preconditions for the transition to multicellularity might be really relevant. And this particular thing there this is one of the new versions of, the, of our, our model, which we call Chimera, uh, where, it, where essentially you, you show that, you can show that aggregates form, they are cooperatively aggregate. We have a, a more or less, um, a more or less uh, average uh, size, and that leads to cell cycles, so sorry, sorry, life cycles. So at some point when the system is under stress, some cells can detach and just move somewhere else, and you start again. Right, which I think is, is, a really, is a really big novelty, still unpublished, but we are on, on, on the move on that. And we have been recently putting in there uh, regulatory networks and see, see how, what happens when you, your genes actually connect to each other and you can actually create more structures. But there's another thing. Just to mention, the, the main message is that you can actually see that some of the, of the major things that people think that happen at the beginning of multicellularity seem to be recreated there. Um, and that probably that's because there's a, a, a single scenario for that. The evolution is unique. I also wanted to mention something that is, I think is spectacular. You have heard about that. Uh, both for theoreticians and engineers, it's a really, really interesting finding. Uh, the, stem cell, the stem cell idea, the whole idea that you can take a cell from a person, from a, your skin, reprogram the cell to get into a stem cell from which you can actually go and create any kind of cell. That's a spectacular finding. It's going to change many things. And it, it broke a lot of rules that we had. We, we thought that something that goes into a final state, a differentiated cell, essentially had to be irreversible. That's not true. That's not true at all. So it, it can be engineered. And another example that I think gives you the perspective of why it's interesting to have an evolutionary perspective when you want to engineer life it's regeneration. Why we do not regenerate our limbs or our fingers if we lose that? And the salamanders do. Why God did that if he loved us so much? So the thing is that it's, it's a trade-off here. Uh, we, we, evolution has prepared us to something much more common and, and more important, which is avoid bleeding. So you have a, if you cut yourself, you have to avoid bleeding. So essentially, it's a lot of repair that goes into that. A salamander is a different life story. Does it mean that we don't have the machinery there? Of course we have it. Uh, why you, you, all, you all the time hear this story of we share with uh, a worm 70% of our genome, as if it was a disgusting thing. But the thing is that we have inherited a lot of evolutionary history. So what happened is the circuits are there but are not used for, for regeneration anymore, which doesn't mean that we cannot make them work. And recently has been found that actually uh, it's possible, for example, to, to reconstruct a whole finger, right, by properly stimulating the stem cells that usually are not going to be stimulated, okay? And this is the example of this guy who actually lost the, the finger and using extracellular matrix as a way of stimulating the stem cells. The whole thing was reconstructed, which means the nail and the fingerprint and everything, right? Which is not, it's not bad news at all. And I'm going to the Blade Runner guy. What happens if you take these stem cells, right? Which, which offer a, a huge opportunity for biomedicine. Uh, you take this, the skin cell, you reprogram, okay? And you put the, the, your stem cells in the context of 
the paths that go into the, the eye, you know, the cells that have in, are involved in building an eye. Well, it's not just that those cells are, are created, it's that they spontaneously organize to build an eye. Why? Well, because they are, they are prepared for doing that. Part of the machinery is connecting to the others and building an eye. So this is not any more kind of a science fiction thing. Something that happens, it is connected at the end with another thing that I, I found really, really fascinating, which is the possibility of actually rebuilding organs or printing organs, which again is, is a, an interesting thing because it's breaking the rule of uh, the evolutionary paths to building tissues. It's always been based on a developmental program. That's not the case anymore. We can actually go from scratch and build them. We'll see how far that goes, but so far it looks like extremely promising. What else? Uh, symbiosis is one of the major things that have happened in evolution. Actually, very often you hear the story that evolution asks if selection and the survival of the fetus is the main story, which is not. Cooperation is the, really the main story. It's a really interesting thing. Symbiosis and other things that have to, have, it, have to do with making different entities to go together into some function, that's, that's the real meat of the whole story. And can, can that, those things be engineered? Well, that's a tricky thing. Um, can, we, can we engineering symb symbiosis or, or things like that? Some steps have been done. Um, for those of you who don't know, actually animals that have, ha are in symbiosis with um, algae, so they actually, the algae are ph photosynthetic and the, you could say that the, the animal is powered by solar energy. And there's been some uh, tries to, to make that, at least to see if you can put algae, for example, inside a fish, which doesn't have those as, in, as, bio, as, as a symbiotic partners. And some things have been observed. I mean, it's not really crazy to think that that might in the future be something stable, stabilized, if you want. Um, and that's, that's one particular example of this work, which I recommend you to give a look. It's, it's an interesting first step. In my lab, we have also shown that if you want to go into the, into the picture of doing, doing all together more complex tasks by sharing part of the information and the processing, you can actually show that a multicellular uh, description of things like associative learning can be, can be built. And that's a great thing because we found out that by using that kind of approach, you know, again, splitting things into different cells, we, we open the door into something really interesting, which is intervening the microbiome and using the microbiome to talk to our cells. So that's, a, that's a really interesting avenue. Another project that we have, which I, I do think uh, when we started, we had some doubts about uh, the likelihood it could work. It's, it's a, a, a project or on bioengineering uh, diabetes type 1. And diabetes type 1, which affects children mostly, um, what happens is that your immune system reacts against your beta cells, the cells that, that actually uh, in the pancreas that give insulin. So it doesn't make any sense to try to put cells back because the immune system is going to destroy them anyway. So one thing that we are, we are trying to do is to re-engineer in that. So the whole circuit of regulation is broken. But what happens if you, if you recreate the circuit with the target of putting part of the circuit maybe in a muscle cell and some other part of the circuit in, in uh, some cell that is in, in, the, in the blood. So it's not anymore in the pancreas, but it's going to regulate and, and, and react to the changes properly. And that, it seemed crazy at the beginning, but it's, it's likely to be interesting to happen. One of the very recent things that have been done in this area, and again, I think that this opens a lot of potential for engineering, is the following. Again, you take your stem cells, you put them in a, in a Petri dish, right, with the right uh, environment. Imagine that the environment is going to cells in the neurons in a, a given particular part of the brain. For example, you know, substantia nigra, if it is for Parkinson, what is your interest, or schizophrenia. And that's one of the interesting things that um, was found, that's uh, the, in the, the right part of the, of the picture. You take cells from schizophrenic people and non-schizophrenic. Schizophrenia is a really difficult thing to, to, actually, um, to actually tell whether or not it's present. It's a multi-factor multi disease. It's a really difficult thing to, to diagnose. Um, imagine you, you do the following. You take the cells, you differentiate in a, in a dish as neurons, and you allow the, the, cell, the, the cell culture to reorganize. What happens is that it reorganizes into, 
into a group of neurons that connect with patterns that's, that clearly differ between schizophrenic and non-schizophrenic. So you have a, a privileged window that we did, it didn't exist before into a, a small-scale connectivity of cells. And actually, you can try with drugs on that, right? And again, have a, a special window to see whether or not the drugs do something. And at the left, there's another way of looking at that. So what happens if this differentiate into cortical, uh, the cortical class of cells in the brain? They do not just differentiate. They form layers. And they form these structures, which, which as you can see, you can identify as it looks like a, a brain, a brain slice, because they try to build kind of a, a mini brain. And the potential for doing interesting stuff from that is great, because what if you, can, you actually build, and there are ways of doing that, you build your microorgan, you build the whole computation you want to do uh, for teaching a disease. So you have a microorgan that might go implant itself within the, the organism, right, and restore some function in a predictable way. That's something that we are exploring too. And, and in the last part of the talk, um, of course, the, the idea of uh, the nervous system as a major innovation and, the, and the, what, what Eoshi Asmari says, the side effects of that, for example, consciousness, is another thing that is interesting to, to explore from the perspective of synthetic perspectives, right? And in particular, um, you'll see that there's one way of approaching that from synthetic biology. Of course, Turing appears to be uh, one of the original thinkers in that perspective. How do you actually tackle the idea of intelligence? What's the meaning of that? And you know the Turing test is one of the, the ways of approaching that, which is controversial, I know. Um, as a side comment, I, I, I recently saw a, a video where they put these two machines that, that play the Turing test uh, talking to each other. It's really interesting conversation. You, you should watch it. It's more interesting than some conversations I, I hear in the bars from time to time. So of course, there's, there's, uh, it's not synthetic biology. There's another synthetic way of approaching uh, that. Uh, you probably know the guy, Luke Stills, who is, who is now in Barcelona. Uh, there's the, the way that for the people like myself interested in what are the potential scenarios where a complex language, for example, could emerge, you, you cannot repeat the story of evolution, but you can actually build something that recreates something like the origin of, of proto-language, of original steps in communication. And as you know, Luke was successful in showing that when you have an embodied system that has to be uh, identifying objects and actions in a given environment and sharing that with a partner, an outcome of that is, is a protogrammer. So something more than just making a, a list of items to refer to things happens. And of course, the question is, how far is, can this go? To what extent things that we know are very important as theoreticians, like ambiguity in language. Ambiguity makes language navigable, so it can actually be very fluid and flexible in building complex sentences because they are navigable thanks to ambiguity. That's something that has been tried to be avoided in, 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 in many parts of computational linguistics, but may be very important to, to have there. This is uh, the kids' version. So just show you my, my two kids discovered that actually if they put in, in front of the other uh, Robo sapiens, we are in our do and our our do do the two sorry uh, something strange happens. Uh, they start to do funny things that we don't understand very well. Really. Um, Robert and Frank, how many of you have seen this movie? One, two, three. How, what happened? Are you like my students or what? Watch it. It's a really interesting movie. It's really interesting because. Uh, in this movie, actually, present what I think is the part of the interesting story that is now going on. Uh, we might be far away from an intelligent robot, maybe far away from a conscious machine, but we are very close to something else, which is the the potential for new ways of creating information between two entities that are completely different. And the movie, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it's about this guy. Um, Frank Langella is the actor. He's a, a guy who has, starts to have Alzheimer's symptoms. So his kids bring a robot to help. The robot is not intelligent, but the relationship between both starts to create something completely new. And it's, it's interesting for many reasons, in particular for the question of Maybe before intelligence comes out, something, some new entity, which is a kind of symbiotic relationship, if you want, 
is going to come out. What is the robot? It's an extension of my personality. Uh, it's something different. Um, yeah, it's a lot of questions. And it's Susan Sarandon in the, in the movie, so everything is there. It's, it's, it's sad and funny and everything, and it's, it's, a, it's a great story. So we, we might not be able to, to do synthetic biology stuff on that, but we can do something about synthetic biology of collective intelligence, which is one of, another of the major transitions. The, the success of insects in Earth, to a very large extent, has to do with the, able, the capacity of going cooperative right, and building collective intelligence. And that's an, one of the great examples of, of emergence, right? Termites inside a termite nest have no clue about how to build a three meters high system, you know? But they do, they do collectively. So the information, it's, it's somewhere else, it's not in the individuals, it's beyond that. So one of the things that we plan in our lab, there's an, another, another research line, which is synthetic collective intelligence, is whether or not can I modify living systems to behave in a way that is in the direction of collective intelligence. We got inspiration from our previous work on mathematical models, uh, some inspiration on, on, on collective robotics, and, and things like this. This is, this is already an old robot that was uh, programmable and uh, had sensors and all, all sorts of things and a, and a clock that was, of course, built in Switzerland. And what we found, and uh, I'm almost finished, what we found in the, uh, a few years ago was that when we, while we were working on mathematical models of our, our gene networks that we were uh, building, that a lot of the mathematics was equivalent to the mathematics we used to describe, and other people used to describe things like how and colonies solve problems like the shortest path, right? Which they can do collectively, right? So we thought maybe there's something, something there in the, in the genetic machine that we're using, and we found out that it's true, that we can actually, that's part of the, the stuff that we are also finishing now, we can actually engineer cells, E. coli cells, which can move, detect others in the environment, to actually behave like ants. So you can actually make the, 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 the E. coli colony to solve the shortest path problem, a thing among, among other things. Part of the work is inspired in, in collective motion that we know uh, in nature. A lot of modeling that has been done there. And, um, and it's really cool to see that you actually can, can modify cells into kind of uh, micro robots that solve collective problems. And just uh, to say that one of the things that also came out from this work and ongoing work is trying to figure out uh, if we can make a map of the universe of computations. So now well, this is a, a qualitative diagram where you put here what's the relevance of space, what's the relevance of diversity, how, how many different objects you have making the computations, and the degree of parallelism of the system, taking parallelism in a, in a broad sense. So you can put, you can place many things there from colon and colonies to neural networks to uh, Fisarum and, and DNA computing, and distributed computation, or we call distributed computation, uh, synthetic one, occupies a particular domain which seems to be occupied only by the immune system. And we do believe that there's still plenty of things um, that have to be found out. Probably have to do with different ways of approaching computation, and probably some of them are going to show that you can break some evolutionary rules uh, in order to build new structures. And that's all, thank you. Yeah, yes. Yes, I, did, I, did, I didn't mention that. One, one of the things that we are, we are actually uh, exploring is if you want to build, for example, finite state machines and, and things like that, we have memory. Uh, one of the things that makes things very simple, especially if you combine uh, the distributed computation using multi-cells with, a, with a, uh, an interface with the computer and optogenetics, 
Yeah, you can, you can actually use a machine to, to do that. You, are you referring to that, that you can use the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's... Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, the second aspect has to do with uh, the philosophy about creating artificial life. Because the impression I get, and forgive my ignorance, but the impression I get is that this kind of approach, this kind of philosophy, what it does is to create complex computers, but it's not creating life. Because when I think of life, I think of, for example, things that happen in the brain that some relate to quantum mechanics, you know. Um, also, uh, the whole question of life, which is connected with the fine-tuning problem of the universe, in which is established that if there was a difference of about 1% in the strong force between the nuclei, life was not, would not be possible. When you are creating artificial life, you don't have that problem because you, you are not subject to this question of evolution that uh, we have, makes us uh, be here together. So, um, so the, the overall question is whether you, you think that this is creating artificial life or whether it is creating a complex computer. Well, uh, well you, you made a kind of broad statement. I, 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 I personally don't believe that quantum mechanics has anything to do with, with brain complexity. But and you mentioned the, the universe too, and, and that's the anthropic principle and all that story. If you are strict, create, making real life means to go into the origins problem. So making artificial cells, which is something that I'm convinced in the next five years we'll see someone, some lab getting out from there, from, from either from the chemistry or either from, from the molecular biology that's been used to try to make protocells. And we work on that for, for several years. It's not, it's not a trivial problem. On the other hand, as I mentioned at the beginning, one, one thing that we want is to see if we can recreate or find alternative paths into the major innovations, thinking in terms of the logic of the problem. So what, how do you jump into from unicellular to multicellular, right? So you can actually think in terms of how far can you go? Can you find out many different ways of doing that? Or instead, there's a strong limitations on that, right? Sorry. So can we, can we have uh, any more questions? Because we don't have very much time. We've had two questions already. Uh, so, so there'll be time in the break for more questions. Sure, sure. Yeah. It was an absolutely amazing talk. Thanks a lot for. Uh, I have a question related to the ethics, perhaps, about of creating living uh, organisms. So, what, what is uh, your opinion about that? Do you think that we should, beside the, our uh, well, curiosity of uh, pushing forward the frontiers of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, should we fix some limits in, uh, in the ethical point of view? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's not uh, a question with a very easy answer. I, I can tell, on the one hand, there's a, there's a part of the ethical issues that have to do with biomedical research that are quite well regulated. So you cannot just go and say, I'm going to, to clone a human or something like that, right? Being First, because it's a stupid thing, but second, because it's not going to happen. But there's, there's one thing that I think is important. Um, in a number of ways, in the future, we will face the question of uh, how far can the engineered organisms going, are going to go. So uh, we can put uh, engineered stuff inside your body, if, but you, if you were engineering the microbiome and that cures the disease, that doesn't mean that this engineering stuff is not going to get out. And on a more, uh, on a more important perspective, I think, um, one of the uh, research lines we are, we are developing in, the, in my lab right now is, is the question of whether or not in a, in a not so far future, when, when our climate starts to put us into, into big trouble, um, whether a different avenue might be needed to be considered. Now, you, you probably have heard of geoengineering the biosphere, you know, geoengineering Earth, like putting things that are extremely costly in the space or whatever. But this is an alternative for that. It's bioengineering the biosphere. You have, you have probably heard of, of terraforming Mars. What about terraforming Earth? What about uh, building things that are going to interfere with our biosphere so that it makes it more predictable and, and might help in solving the problem. 
So there's a lot of big issues that uh, in the next year will, will, will be a hot topic. I think we'll have to stop the questions. There'll be more chance to talk to Ricard at, at the coffee break, which is at 11 o'clock. So thanks again, Ricard. Thank you. So we have uh, two uh, regular talks now before the coffee. So I'm going to pass over to Barbara Mazzolai, who will, will chair the session. Thank you, Tony, and good morning to everybody. I'm Barbara Mazzolai from uh, Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia, and please.